Hey everybody, this is Darren Van Dam, and you're watching Flick Connection, the show that helps you get more out of movies, and today I want to do my very best attempt at trying to pick apart Mandy. Now this video is going to contain massive spoilers, uh, so I'd recommend watch the movie first. I did do a full review on it with no spoilers. I'll put a link to that in the description. You can rent Mandy or buy it on Amazon Prime, basically anywhere you might rent or stream uh, movies. So check out the movie. I recommend it, particularly if you're into new, weird, and interesting things. But that said, let's try to pick this thing apart. Now, for me, one of the biggest clues, or at least threads to grab onto in trying to decode this movie, and at least what the director might have been trying to say, is the opening title track, which is Starless by King Crimson. Now, the reason I latched onto this is because it's essentially the only musical track in a movie with a beautiful score that has lyrics. There's one exception, and we're gonna get to that in a minute, but it really is the only one that has lyrics, and so that is significant to me. Not only is it the only one that has lyrics, the movie opens with it, the main character is introduced with it, with no other dialogue, and it's so significant that the director bothered to put the title of it in the opening credits, which you don't always get. It's a long song, I believe it's like 12 minutes in its full cut, but there's only actually three different verses in it that are sung very, very slowly. And essentially the refrain states, Starless and Bible Black, and I believe Bible Black is just a reference to the fact that there was a time where most, not all, but most Bibles were black and they were jet black, and it's just a way of describing uh, an intense blackness, you know, the, the black void, if you will, and referring to it as Bible black, as far as I can tell, and, and some of you may know a little bit more about the, the meaning of that phrase, but uh, the, the reference to that is just, just a hint at Christianity, which this movie is actually filled with Christian symbolism and things like that, and we're going to get into all of that. Before we get into any of the characters, I do want to quickly mention the house that Mandy and Red both live in. Uh, it's out in the middle of the woods, it's secluded, but it also uh, is very transparent. It's really made of a bunch of panes of glass. And this is by design, I would imagine. I mean, this is it's an odd house. It does not look really that natural, and it really doesn't look that practical. But I think it's a hint at them living sort of this transparent, open uh, uh, lifestyle, at least with each other. Uh, and they're out there in the middle of the woods, and even when they sleep at night, which is a very significant scene there, uh, they're essentially just outside in the woods almost. I mean, they're inside and it's glass, but all you can see is the outside. So that, that was an interesting production design. And don't, don't just assume that that's by accident. You know, something that uh, uh, distinct is definitely done on purpose. Now, the beginning of the movie, the sequence with her with the starlings, the sequence where they're in bed and they're talking about their favorite planets, where he's looking at what she's drawing. All of those scenes, even though I do feel like they're, they're painfully slow, the, the whole purpose of them is to establish Mandy. And not to just establish her character, but to establish how Red sees her. Best example is when she's talking about her favorite planet. She says Jupiter, and he takes a moment and like breathes in and says Jupiter back to her. He is just infatuated with everything she has to say, everything about her. He's completely consumed with her. So that's very significant, and, and the reason he goes on the journey that he goes on in the second half of the film. Now, the antagonist or villain of the movie, Jeremiah, the cult leader of the Children of the New Dawn, we're not really told too much about the Children of the New Dawn, but Jeremiah is really the, the embodiment of the male ego. And no, that doesn't mean he represents all men, but he represents that just that consumption, that I'm going to take everything sort of side of the male ego, that is fairly distinctly male. So that's really his purpose for the movie, and that is, that is ultimately what he's representing, among several other things. While we're on the subject of Jeremiah, he is the source of most, if not all, of the Christian symbolism in the movie. He wears a fairly large gold cross, and so do a couple of his, I think all of his followers actually wear a gold cross. Not only does he mention Jesus, uh, he also seems to suggest that he might be more, more powerful than Jesus, or at least maybe smarter than Jesus. Uh, I believe his direct quote in the movie, right before he stabs Red, right where Christ was stabbed on the cross, he says Jesus' big mistake was he didn't offer up a sacrifice. To me, that suggests that he feels like he's sort of maybe the next incarnation and he's smarter and he's going to play 
uh, his hand better than Christ. So that part was interesting to me. And a subtle thing I might be digging a little bit too deep on is he mentions the Carpenters when he begins to play his record. Uh, he asks if you've ever heard of the Carpenters, and he says he loves the Carpenters. Jesus was a Carpenter. Of all the bands, of all the sort of folksy sort of bands that they could have mentioned, they, the director, Panos, specifically put in the Carpenters, so I think that's significant. And then he immediately follows up that line with This Is Much Better, talking about his own album. So again, he's sort of maybe, maybe referencing Christ and then saying that he's uh, better, or his work is better. So I thought that was maybe an interesting play. That's the one area I might be digging a little bit too deep, but I found that pretty interesting. And continuing with the Christian symbolism, because again, we've got Bible black repeated over and over again in the opening title sequence. The black riders, to me, easily represent the four horsemen. There's four of them. There could have been three. There could have been five. There could have been six. There could have been any number of them. There's four, and they're all uniquely different. Very, very much like the four horsemen. They're riding on the modern day equivalent of horses. I think none of that is a mistake. And the interesting thing about them is they are completely black. There's just very few, like the light hits them with some highlights, you can see some details. But go back and watch the movie. With one or two little exceptions with the lighting, you really cannot see them. They're, they're almost a black void. Uh, especially as far as like a film would go and to look realistic, they become a black void. And I'm going to touch back on that as a minute because I'm trying to stay somewhat linear with this story. Now I'm going to touch one more time on Jeremiah Sand because this is the middle point in the, the fulcrum of this movie because it's essentially two different movies. You've got the first half and then it pivots right and almost to the minute on the middle mark of this movie, which I find really, really interesting. But there's a scene where they've given Mandy all the LSD, the special stuff with the cherry on top, and then uh, uh, Jeremiah exposes himself to her in multiple ways. Now obviously you see his dick hanging out for a good solid 30 seconds, but he also gets right in her face and completely, he doesn't just expose like his, his mysticism, which is what, really what he's trying to do, he's trying to sort of overpower her with that. He also, I think unknowingly, sort of exposes the fact that he's a failed musician, that he created that album and that the higher ups wouldn't know genius if it bit him or however he says it, but he's, and he gets a little angry and he really kind of exposes where all of this comes from, where this, what led him on this path was really just rejection. And then they sort of, they do this beautiful job, Panos rather, does this beautiful job where he melds the two of their faces together and you're looking at, at Jeremiah for a solid, what I think is a solid 120 seconds, maybe longer, and his face pans back and forth sort of between hers and his. I thought that was absolutely beautiful. And it hypnotizes you into thinking he's hypnotizing her. And then what immediately happens? As soon as he exposes himself physically, she laughs at him. And then the violence that ensues after that, the burning, is a direct result of his humiliation. And I find that really interesting as well. I have heard before that violence very often will come out of a place of, of embarrassment or humiliation. And when you really think about that, that's very, very true. Think about like a bar fight situation, anything like that where someone might lash out in violence, a lot of times that will come from a place of embarrassment and humiliation, and it, it very much does here. Ah, uh, the Cheddar Goblin. Okay, so I don't think there's too much looking into regarding the Cheddar Goblin as far as it being a goblin. But it is a significant scene in the sense that Red has just come back in from seeing Mandy burned alive, which was horrific. He, he's, he's held her ashes and they've basically disintegrated in his hands. He's come back in, he's holding the shirt, the last thing that she wore, and then this weird TV commercial comes on with the a vomiting goblin throwing up macaroni and cheese all over kids. It's this weird juxtaposition that suddenly happens there. And it, at that moment is where the movie changes because immediately he lays his head down. He has this vision, this animated, this cartoon-like vision of Mandy and her face is rotting. And we'll come back to that in a second. And then as soon as he wakes up out of that, that, that lasts maybe five seconds, we have the bathroom scene. So I love the bathroom scene for several reasons. One, we, we find out Red's an alcoholic, or at least a recovering alcoholic. He has a stash. He's choking down 
the vodka and the, the cinematography changes dramatically in this one. Everything was ethereal and dark and, and you know had a certain look to it and suddenly the lights flick on, we're in this bathroom, the camera's not moving, we see Red in his underwear with the tiger shirt which is significant, we're gonna get to that in a minute, and he's just choking down the vodka and that is, boom, that is where the movie changes. So let's talk a little bit more about the Black Void. Uh, in the beginning, uh, when they're sleeping, the camera pans up to the sky and the sky is actually anything but a black void. It's anything but starless. There's not only a lot of stars, but there's this ethereal sort of aurora borealis thing happening. So the sky is, is completely not a black void in their lives at that time. But then the black riders literally come out of a black void. The headlights just emerge out of nowhere from just a black screen and they come out of blackness. Every time someone's on LSD in the movie, their pupils get so dilated, their eyes are literally a black void. The movie itself becomes darker and darker. There's more blacks on screen, whereas before there was a lot of color, a lot of saturation. The saturation starts to drop. There's still color, but the screen is much, much darker the further and further red sort of descends down this journey. And not only does the screen become darker, but so does red. He straps on the armor. He begins to get covered in almost tar-like blood. He himself begins to represent the demons that he is fighting. I say represent. He begins to resemble them as he just becomes darker and darker as he's covered in muck and their armor. I thought that was a really interesting take because as he's fighting them and killing him, you know, as he's literally battling his demons, he's sort of becoming one as well. Now this is a revenge fantasy, you know, there's a lot of fantasy elements to it that aren't necessarily meant to be taken literal or meant to be perfectly explained. And you could say that a lot of this is Red's dream and it's his revenge fantasy that he's having after she's been killed, but I don't think so. I think it's supposed to really happen, and I think it's supposed to happen in a world that is not ours, a world that's a little bit off of ours, because it does take place in 1983, there is Reagan, but it's almost as if it's a slight alternate history or something. The world's a slightly different place. That's kind of the way I look at it, that this stuff's really happening to Red. He really is killing these these beasts, but that, you know, I don't exist in that world in 1983. Of course, I was born in 84, but that, you know, my parents don't exist in that same world. It's a different world than the one that we know. That's sort of how I look at this. Now, as Red is battling his demons, uh, the visions of Mandy, the animated visions, they become better. Whereas at first her face was rotting, then we see her sort of standing over this giant purple-like tiger, pulling like a green glowing emerald out of its, you know, chest cavity. Uh, so she begins to have more and more power as he's uh, uh, battling the demons, so to speak. Now, the, I'll, I'll be brief on this because the chemist does confuse me. I struggle with the chemist a little bit. I'm not sure really what that represents, but the chemist is not an enemy. The chemist rather did not wrong him in any way. If anything, the chemist is very much full of empathy and realizes how much they've been wronged. And at this point, Red really represents the tiger. The tiger is literally let out of the cage. It doesn't attack Red because they are one and the same. It's represented, you know, Red's got the tiger on his shirt early on, and then he's now become the beast. So I thought that was an interesting take. So something's happening there. The gold Luger, you know, the Luger was the sidearm of choice for the Third Reich. I, there's got to be something significant to that, but I, I haven't figured that out. If you've got any thoughts, let me know in the comments. Speaking of hateful symbols, the steeple of the church at the bottom of the... the the quarry essentially to me really looked a lot like a KKK hood that very very steep design that very very steep isosceles triangle uh, I don't know if I'm looking too much into that as well but the KKK is a good representation of how people have twisted Christianity and used God and Christianity for evil that has happened a lot in history I'm not saying Christians are evil uh, but people have certainly used God and Christianity for evil purposes exactly the same way Jeremiah has. And then I thought the ending was really beautiful in the sense that Red puts down this axe that he's forged, that he's, he's slayed everybody with, and kills Jeremiah with his hands, and Jeremiah grovels in one of the most perfect ways possible, and he really just crushes his skull with his hands, which isn't probably even possible, but... 
he kills Jeremiah with his hands, whereas Jeremiah killed Mandy. He had someone else kill Mandy. In fact, when she died, no one was touching her. So there's an interesting juxtaposition there. And then the church burns in the same way that Mandy burned, and we're immediately given a real vision of Mandy. She's no longer a, a illustration or a cartoon. She's in the car with Red as he drives back down out of the mountain. So there is a lot to decode with this movie. I am still trying to figure it out, but I got such a good response from my review that I wanted to share my thoughts because I have watched it twice now. I gotta say, I did like it even more the second time around. If you like Mandy or just want to at least get in the mood to go see Mandy, I've created a custom playlist on Spotify. I'll put a link in the description for that playlist. You're welcome to go listen to it. I would encourage you to. Uh, in addition to my movie recommendations, I do plan on starting to give music recommendations through this Spotify account. So follow me, follow the playlist, check it out. Feel free to come back here and let me know what tracks you're really digging. Uh, let me know what your thoughts are on this movie in the comments below, but I'll make more videos like this in the future if you want me to. But thanks for checking this episode out, and you will see me on the next one. Oh, <laughs>